want to hear from you. I pray, God, that today your voice, your truth, your person be presented and be listened to. This season is a season of reflection as we think about the Messiah, Jesus himself, coming to this sinful world to ransom, to save mankind. And Father, through the foolishness of preaching, you have given us the opportunity to hear you speak. So Father, soften our hearts, give us ears to hear your word and hearts to understand and comprehend but Father, we pray that you may add into that equation the power of your Holy Spirit, which will work the change in our lives. Is our prayer in Jesus' name, and we all say, Amen. My sermon title is Christ's Mindset. Testing. Testing. Oh, now you can hear me. Oh, look at that. This whole time. I was using the preacher's voice. Oh, yes, that sounds much better. Again, my sermon title is Christ's Mindset. During my study, something opened up, and there are times, it's not very often, but there are times when the sermon goes a different route. And uh, today, even though the title is Christ's Mindset, we might uh, end up somewhere else. So if you're um, wanting me to stick with the title, I hate to disappoint, but I might have to this morning. Christ's Mindset. Uh, I came across a story recently in a book that you would probably enjoy. The story is a very good story. In fact, it, 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 it re reminded me of something very, very important. I'm all about reading good books, and this book is, is, a, is quite the mission story, telling about the journey of a man by the name of Andrew Vander Bijil. Brother Andrew, as he is affectionately called, had the privilege of ministering behind the Iron Curtain. The book is called God's Smuggler. I picked it up because of the unique title, God's Smuggler? Can you imagine? God's Smuggler. But this story is a fascinating story. Andrew felt called at a young age to go um, into the regions of Europe when the Bible was illegal, when communism reigned supreme, and he wanted to ensure that the people of God had the word of God available to them. Listen to the story. He talks about a moment in his missionary journey when he visited Romania. He was meeting with a fellow Christian. They were in this office. It was him, another person, and this other brother by the name of Jan. Jan was in his old age, and all three were in this office, Brother Andrew, Brother Jan, and Brother Jan's secretary. They were all sitting around this desk. They were having a conversation. You see, back then, it wasn't safe to just give Bibles to any and everybody because sometimes people would tell on you, and you would get arrested, and then you couldn't do your work. Brother Andrew would deliver Bible. The way he smuggled the Bibles behind the Iron Curtain was to use a Volkswagen Beetle. Can you imagine he would fit hundreds and hundreds of Bibles in his Volkswagen Beetle, and he would drive across the border, and every single time he would say a word of prayer, and he would say, God, I know that they're going to be searching this Beetle, but I pray that you blind the eyes of the guards and the soldiers so that they don't see the hundreds and hundreds of Bibles in my car. And every single time he left the Bibles on the, in the open, they weren't covered, and every single time he would cross the border, they would search the car, and they would tell him, go forward, as if they didn't see the Bibles. God blinded the eyes of those men. But this time, Brother Andrew was in this office. He was meeting with Brother Yun. There was a secretary right there. And Brother Andrew discovered something that was extremely difficult. As he was in this office, he realized that Brother Yun did not speak his language. The secretary could not translate for Brother Andrew. And Brother Andrew could not speak their language. And so they were stuck in this room, not being able to understand one another. Can you imagine that? And here it is. He's in this room. And he's trying to figure out, how do I communicate with Brother Yun to make sure that this is the right person that God wants me to give the Bible to, or Bibles to? Brother Andrew recognized that on Brother Yun's desk, there was an old Bible worn out because he was reading it. The pages were torn. They were worn down. And he realized in that moment, uh, he realized something. In that moment, he realized something very important, that there was another way that he could communicate. 
And so Brother Andrew decided, I'm going to open my Bible. We're going to try to have a conversation through the Word of God. So he opened his Bible and turned it to 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 20, which reads, All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. He turned, opened his Bible and uh, pointed it in Brother Yun's direction and pointed his finger to the reference. And Brother Yun saw the reference, opened his own Bible in his own translation, in his own language. And he read the verse and he smiled. Brother, Brother Andrew just greeted me and he read that text. And then Brother Young decided, you know what, I'm going to communicate myself through a verse to Brother Andrew. And so he turned in his Bible to Proverbs 25, verse 25, which reads, As cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. <laughs> Brother Andrew was smiling now. He was laughing. Brother Young and Brother Andrew were having a conversation through the Word of God. And it went on for about 30 minutes. They were just talking through Bible verses upon Bible verses. Brother Andrew turned next in his Bible to the book of Philemon, and there the text read, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and your faith which you have toward our Lord. Brother Yun smiled and turned next in his Bible to another verse which read, For I have derived much joy and comfort from you, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. And this was the way that Brother Andrew found out that God wanted him to deliver the 100 Bible to the Christians in Romania. There is a new way to communicate, friends. There is a new way to speak to one another. Brother and brother can communicate through the word of God. There is something special about the word of God. There is something special about the Bible. No soon do you open it and God begins to speak to you. No soon do you open the Bible and you stumble upon God saying something. There is always something for you and I in the word of God. You open the Bible and right there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible tells you, and God said... Oh, friends, imagine the creation story hanging on every single word of God. And God said, let there be. And there was the word of God. Can you imagine the whole of creation hanging on to the word of God? That day, God broke the silence and the darkness and the void by filling it with his speech, his words. Let there be light. And there was light. David says in Psalm 33 in verse 9, he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Oh, I just love that text in Psalm 33 and verse 9. Can you imagine the day of creation? That day the universe responded to God's word. God said, and the world stumbled out of his dark stupor and formed itself into what God intended it to be. And God said, can you imagine the power contained in his word so as to have the effect of organizing atoms in order to form matter? And God said would be repeated in Genesis chapter 1 alone 10 times. How many times? 10 times. And God said... Can you imagine the sun, the massive ball of fire coming into place simply because God said it? According to NASA, the sun is so big, so vast, that if you were to hollow it out and put the earth inside, it would take one million earth to fill the sun. But the sun is not the biggest star. There are other, other celestial bodies out there that are much larger than the sun. This tiny speck of earth God spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. And God said, and the stars found their place in the vast solar system, assembled in order among other celestial bodies in the universe. Friends, God's word has power. Can you imagine how powerful the word of God must be to not only create but set into motion the things that sustain life? His word is so powerful that everything is done right the first time. When we walk outside, praise God, the sky doesn't fall on us. The earth spins just at the right speed and doesn't throw itself out of orbit occasionally. Friends, our God is powerful. He doesn't have to show up. He could just say the word and that's enough. The Bible tells us of a story in Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. 
page one, one, uh, 1,119 in your pew Bibles, a commander in the Roman army came to Jesus with a prayer request. He was burdened because one of his servants was sick to the point of dying, and he came to Jesus begging Jesus, come and help my servant because he is at the point of death. But Jesus heeded the prayer request of the man. He turned around and was ready to follow the man to his house. And the man bowed his knees and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant will be healed. That day when Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. God's word went on an errand. When Jesus said it will be done that very moment, his word took the fastest route out of Israel, went into the house of a Gentile and touched a dying man and brought him back to life. God's word is powerful. Are you hearing me this morning? Oh, friends, there is something about the word of God. David says in Psalm 107, verse 20, that God's word has the ability to perform doctor's visits. Notice what it says. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Jesus spoke at the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11. When I read the Bible, there are times when my imagination takes me into these scenes and I imagine what it would be like to be standing outside of these stories and to be witnessing what is taking place. Can you imagine standing there behind Jesus as he walks up to the tomb of Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come forth. Can you imagine being there on the edge trying to figure out, is it really going to happen? And you realize as the stone had already been rolled away, you see some white hopping out of that grave. Can you imagine Lazarus being dead, hearing the word of God and coming back to life? His ears, his eyes start flickering behind the wrapped cloth and he hops out. That would be like those who were right there with Jesus as Jesus realized that they couldn't comprehend what had taken place. Jesus had to give them instructions further. Un unwrap the man. You'd be so surprised. You'd be like, wait, wait, what? Forget about Lazarus. The fact that this miracle is so surprising, let's not even unwrap him. Let's frame him and uh, keep him for a very long time. Hopefully not. Friends, the word of God is so powerful. The Bible says in Psalm 147 in verse 15, he sends out, now notice this, he sends out his command to the earth, his word when he speaks. Notice the next verse, the next words. His words run swiftly. How fast? When God speaks, his word does not delay. It runs swiftly. His word, once sent, crosses all barriers. It speeds its way to success. And God said to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55 and, pay, and verse 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I I sent it. God's word never returns from an errand saying, I couldn't do it. His word accomplishes what he, what he pleases. Oh, friends, you and I have the great privilege of communicating through the scriptures. You and I have the privilege of communicating with, you and I have the privilege of understanding the mind of God through the word of God that runs so swiftly and does so much in the world that God himself created with his word. This season, we pause to celebrate the origin story, the birth of Jesus Christ coming, breaking forth. I don't even use, like using the word coming into because the story is a breaking into the world to interrupt the process of humanity who was going on a downward trajectory. God had to rescue us, and so he broke in as a baby in Bethlehem. Can you imagine the king of the universe making himself subject to a mother? Can you imagine the king of the universe born in a stable? Can you imagine the king of the universe growing up and learning words? Can you imagine the king of the universe learning to say, Dada? Oh, friends, our God is a mighty God. 
when we think about the origin story around this time of the year, we, we talk about the story of, 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 of Jesus and Bethlehem and the chosen couple Mary and Joseph. We talk about Elizabeth and, and the priest Zechariah or the shepherds who watch their flocks by night. We talk about the three wise men. And by the way, there weren't three. The Bible just says wise men. We don't know how many there were. So just in case. You see, Jesus, you see, John, when he wrote the book of John, the fourth gospel, the fourth installment, the foretelling of the story of Jesus, he couldn't just pause on the history of Jesus. Matthew had to deal with, Matthew wanted to deal with the kingship of Jesus, and so he traces the line, the history of Jesus, all the way down from David on the throne, all the way unto Christ being born in Bethlehem. You see, Luke really wanted to focus in on the humanity of Jesus, and so he hones in on the idea he was born a servant, and so he talks about the priesthood, Zechariah serving in the temple, and Mark was just rushing on to the cross. He didn't even spend time on the birth story of Jesus, but John, instead of going forward with the history, decided to go backward because he wanted you to see Jesus as being much more than just a baby in Bethlehem. John couldn't just settle for the history of Christ's humanity. During his contemplation of his Lord, the Holy Spirit led this man called John down the mysterious path of Christ's divinity. And when John came back down to earth, all he could come up with in trying to explain who this baby was, he settled with, he is the word. He is all that God has to say. He is all that God has to say. And friends, you and I need to listen to his word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. You see, John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 is a Hebrew poem. It is a poem. We often quote it, we often read it, but we don't realize the, the power of this poetry. You see, in Hebrew poetry, it's not like English poetry where we rhyme words. You know, uh, roses are red, violets are blue. You know, um, what's the rest of it? Do you know the rest of it? Okay, some of you do. You're smiling, so you know it. Right? Hebrew poetry rhymes thoughts. And so there's something here that I want you to see. He begins the poem with, in the beginning. Verse 2, he ends the poem with, in the beginning. In the middle, he has these words, was with God, and was God. In Hebrew poetry, what they do, they do what is called like a sandwich, and in the middle is the central phrase. In other words, this is what the author really wants you to contemplate. Who is this word? You see, this word was in the beginning. But ultimately, what I want you to see is this, words, is, is this word, who he is, and who he's connected to. Who he is and who he's connected to. So we're going to break down this poem. In verse 1, we find what scholars call a triadic statement. But taken as a whole, with two in, uh, it, it, this, this poem is classic Hebrew poetry with words that are not rhymed but thoughts being rhymed, where the first sentence gets repeated at the end. What John is doing in this text is to summarize all the actions of God in the Old Testament that was already written and explain to you the whole New Testament, which is now being written. And both meet in this one word. Oh, friends, this is a beautiful picture. I hope you see it. He is summarizing the gospel. How do you summarize the story of Jesus? He comes to this point, in the beginning was the word. Is that a good summary? It needs to be explained. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. We're coming right back to that. This means every revelation, every prophetic utterance, every manifestation, John packs it into this one word. But friends, when we say word in the English language, it does not, it does not convey really what John was thinking. It is better to read this passage and remove the word, word, and put in the word logos in the Greek. Logos has a deeper meaning. It's more beautiful in its imagery. Logos so we could read it this way, in, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. 
The word logos means much more than just speech. Its deeper meaning is wisdom. It means one who put things together, the unifying of both the thoughts and the expression of those thoughts. It is not just what is being said, but what is meant when something is said. Look at Jesus if you want things to be put together in your life. Look at Jesus if you want to see the world properly put together. Look at Jesus if you want to see humanity being put together in a real way. He is everything put together. In Christ, we get the opportunity to read into the deep things of God. This oneness is important in that it also means that there is no contradiction between what God says and who he is. You see, you and I are contradictory in our speech. You see, we could be described with an opposite word called dialogos. Dialogos means no unity between what we say and what we do. Have you heard the saying, listen to what I say, but do, don't do what I... That's dialogos. It means to be double-tongued. It means to be contradictory in your act as it, and, and as it relates to your speech. You may say one thing and do another, but not God. Whatever he says is what he does. Whatever he says is who he is. If God says he's going to be somewhere at a certain time, he will be there because he said it. If God said you are forgiven, it means you are forgiven. Oh, friends, do you believe the word of God? You and I find ourselves out of harmony without, with our speech. We say one thing and do another. God never double speaks. What he says is what he means. He, what he says is who he is. There is no contradiction within himself. He is the Logos. He is what he says he is. Why begin the origin story of Jesus this way? This powerful triadic poem tells us, in the beginning was the Logos. In the beginning of time, God had thoughts. In the beginning of time, God had activities. In the beginning of time, God was up to something. Before the creation was, God was already there. The Logos is before his creation, meaning Christ was not created. He has already been there. This removes all reason for idolatry. You can never be a keeper of the word of God and worship, it, and worship anything or any other but God. Before there was a Genesis, there was a Logos. In other words, there can be no new, new creation. <clears throat> Pardon me. There can be no new creation without Christ. Nothing new in our lives can ever come to be except it be through him. Jesus is being introduced for the second time as the one initiating a new Genesis. And so in other words, John is, re is retelling the creation story. Jesus comes again to recreate the world. You know how the story ended up. God made the world. He gave everything to Adam and Eve. They were supposed to dress and keep the garden. They messed up in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent had intervened and, and usurped the position. And now the world was torn to pieces. And Christmas is not the same. Because as much as we enjoy the joyous celebration, there is pain still in our hearts. As we experience the trying, trying things in our lives. And the list goes on and on in a sinful world. But Jesus wanted to recreate humanity. The Apostle Paul would take this idea and say, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things are passed away and all things have become new. Jesus is the only one who can recreate you. No one else can. And so as much as God said, and it was done in the beginning, God is still saying something to you, and he wants it to be done in you. This word still speaks. This word of God still has something to say to humanity. The center of the poem emphasizes the primary point of the discourse. This is what John wants you to remember as you go away from this poem. Remember that Jesus is Logos. The Logos is divine. He is more than just a baby born in Bethlehem. He, this takes Jesus out of the pages of history and places him squarely in the domain of divinity. 
There are many people who celebrate Christmas. Nine out of ten Americans do, but not many believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Even scholars now teaching on university campuses are saying that Jesus is no more than just a historical figure. Friends, let us not celebrate him as just a historical figure. He is the Son of God. He is God himself. Oh, friends, I'm getting excited now. We're talking about my Lord. My Lord Jesus, the Son of God, came to this sinful world to die to save humanity. We must see him more than just in history, in the pages of history. We must see him as God himself in the flesh. And the Logos, notice what John says next. The Logos was with God. The Logos must be seen not in his person only, but through his fellowship with the Father. You see, Jesus, when he told us, his disciples, to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father, who art in heaven. You see, he wanted to teach them that when you relate to me, you're also relating to my Father. You see, with Jesus comes another connection, friends. It is not only him. We get connected to uh, the Trinity. Oh, friends, and all the promises Paul would later say, in him are yes. Oh, friends. When you talk to the Father in Christ, the promises are already answered. It is yes. Jesus would later say, I and the Father are one. To Philip, he said, if you have seen me, you have also seen the Father. He should be known through his connection with the Father. Even our prayers are affected by this communion. So this baby born in Bethlehem is not an isolated person. He is connected to God himself, the Father in Jesus, we see a complete picture of the mind, the thoughts, the words of God. Jesus is God's way of telling all that he's still speaking. When Jesus was glorified in the presence of his disciples, now turn to me in the Bible to so Luke chapter 9 and verse 35. We are on page 1194 in your pew bibles the disciples had been walking out of this place where jesus was glorified in their presence a cloud overshadowed them and the disciples heard god the father speaking about the son and in that moment the bible tells us there that god when god spoke the bible tells us and a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son hear him john is telling the origin story of Jesus this way because he noticed and realized that a lot of people were thankful for Jesus, but not many people were listening to Jesus. He had realized that a lot of people were grateful for the gift of salvation, but not many people listened to what the gift had to say about salvation. He realized that a lot, of people were, a lot of people were celebrating the fact that God broke into this world to recreate us, but not many were listening to what the Word himself had to say about this recreation. God, now John realized that people were at the same time celebrating Jesus, but yet still rejecting his person. He realized that many people were thankful that God had done something special, that the birth of Jesus simply was nothing more than a celebration even though there was no faith in the midst of those who celebrated. John, in telling the story of Jesus this way, is trying to tell us he is much more than a baby to be celebrated. He is God who needs to be listened to. We have one of the greatest privileges ever given to humanity. Paul would give it this way. He would say it this way in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, page 1372 in your few Bibles. Let's turn there and we'll read that verse. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. The Bible tells us, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. I have it in my notes. I'm just going to turn there to save us some time. Hebrews 1, verses 2 to 3. The Bible says, God, God, who? God, some of you are still turning there. I'll give you a second to do so. God, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. God, who what? Oh, at various times and in various ways, what did he do? He spoke 
in time past to the fathers by who? By the prophets, first of all. But now notice what God does. He turns his attention away from the prophet and he now decides that he would speak to the world another way. As in these last days, friends, do you see those words? As in these last days spoken to us by his son. How is God speaking? By his son, whom he had appointed here of all things through whom also he made the world. God is now saying that the best argument that I could ever make for humanity to serve me, for humanity to see that I am who I am, and for humanity to see that I am the God who saves, the best way for me to communicate that is through the Son. Oh, friends, if you want to see what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to understand the mind of God, look at Jesus. If you want to know how loving God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know how compassionate God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know how kind God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know how powerful God is, look at Jesus. There's a story in the Gospels that tells us one day that Peter had been in, in, in a discussion with some, with, some, with some people. They had argued, they were arguing with Peter about the fact that Jesus was not a taxpayer. They came to Peter and said, does your master pay taxes, yes or no? Peter didn't realize what was going on, so he comes to Jesus, and before he could open his mouth and say a word, Jesus asked him a question. Peter, who is greater, the one who is a son or the one who is a servant? Does the son pay taxes, yes or no, if the son is in charge of the father's business? Peter couldn't really respond, but Jesus said, lest we offend them, let me tell you what to do, Peter. Go down to the Sea of Galilee. Bring with you your hook and, and, and your line. Cast the hook into the sea, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. When you get there, there's going to be a fish. When you cast the line, the fish will hang on to it. In the mouth of that fish, there will be a coin. Take that coin because it will be sufficient to pay both my taxes and your taxes. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being Peter? Maybe along the way, Peter is struggling to try to figure out, wait, is this really going to happen? I mean, if, if I have a very, you know, I look at Peter as... You know, similar to myself, there are a lot of times when I see in Peter a lot of me. I just imagine if Peter is going along the ways, ah, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, you know what, you know what, he said I should, so I'm going to do it anyway, but maybe it's not going to work. I don't know what's going to come out of this, but tell you what, I'm going to give it a try. Peter grabs the, 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 the instrument. See, he's a fisherman. He knows that fish, the, 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 that's not the way they operate. He knows that you don't cast the line and the fish just say, hey, where's the line? Let me grab onto it and be brought home to you. He knows that that's not, not how the system works. But now Peter goes there. Can you imagine the creator of the universe in conversation with the fish? Friends, just, just pardon my imagination for a moment. Can you imagine Jesus saying to the fish, hey, Peter is on his way. You have a coin you swallowed maybe two years ago. I need that coin. Go and meet Peter on the, on the, uh, by, by the lake. When you, when you see Peter cast the hook, he's going to cast it around 2 o'clock. Make sure you're there on time to meet the hook. And when you meet the hook, grab onto it because I need the coin in your belly. And the fish says, okay, what time? I'll make sure I'm going to be there on time. The fish shows up. Peter pulls the fish. and There's a coin. Friends, do you see the power of God? If I were Peter, I'd have taken that fish. I would have taken the coin, I'll pay the taxes, but I would have been boasting. I would have said, you know, like you asked my master if he paid taxes, I'll tell you what. You know what? I'm not even going to take the coin out. You go ahead. Put, put your head in here. I'll show you something. Hey, go ahead. Put your... You see that? Don't ever ask about taxes again. <laughs> I'll take the fowl, then take the fish and go frame it on my wall. And every time people come to visit, I'll say, this is the fish that Jesus, this is the fish that Jesus sent me to get. Friends, our God is powerful. Amen. Oh, he controls the fish of the sea. Oh, friends, Jesus speaks in the Old Testament. He speaks in the New Testament. I think of another story of a fish where Jonah was on his disobedient errand and he jumped and he was thrown overboard and God said to a whale, hey, a fish, whatever it was. I, God said to this fish, hey, I, I need Jonah to be delivered to Nineveh. Make sure you're on time to get him. And when Jonah falls over the, 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 the overboard, the fish was already there to swallow the guy. Brings him to Nineveh in order for him to do his work. Friends, our God is powerful. Everything in nature responds to the Logos. The question is, are you responding to it? 
Are you responding to this word? When Mary realized that there was no wine at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, she goes to, the G- to Jesus, they converse, because he wa- she wanted a solution to the problem. And when Jesus told her, my time is not yet come, but, G- but Mary saw in Jesus a willingness to do the miracle anyway, G- Mary said to the servants, listen, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And that day, a miracle was worked. A great reformer once stood among some people who had been worshiping Mary. And he stood in this public square. This was a time when, when um, the church um, was predominantly uh, Catholic in its, in, its, in its belief. And he stood in this circle and he professed, he preached this sermon called Listen to Him. He took the story of Mary and said, Mary is telling you that there is someone greater than herself. Listen to the Son of God. He is the one you should listen to. Friends, listen to him. Listen to him who tells you that you are a child of God. Listen to him who tells you that with God all things are possible. Listen to him who tells you that you need to be born again. Listen to him who tells you that without him you can do nothing. Listen to him who tells you that you have a father in heaven, therefore that makes you a child. Listen to him who tells you that there is a resurrection. Listen to him who tells you that he is coming soon. Listen to him. He is a king born in a manger. He is perfection, yet he loves imperfect people. He is wisdom who gave time to the unwise. He is majestic, yet his principal ethic is humility. He is a judge who was killed unlawfully. His life was taken, yet he gives life to everyone. Listen to him. He is the son of God. David says in Psalm 119, verse 147, In Christ, friends, God said everything he wanted to say. There is not another Messiah. This is why Peter could boldly preach. There is no name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. No other name except the name of Jesus. This Christmas season, we celebrate his birth. But friends, my point is this to you. Listen to him. Listen to him and what he's saying to you. Listen to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, because he has much to tell you. David says in Psalm 119, verse 47, Arise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. He says, I I hope, I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches. Why does David stay awake? He answers this question by telling us that I may meditate on your word. He stays awake to meditate on the word of God. This is your opportunity to respond to him. Christ discloses the mind of God. Therefore, if he speaks, listen to him. Think of the areas in your life where you have not been listening to what Jesus has to say to you. Perhaps he has asked you to let go of some sin that easily besets you. Perhaps he has asked you to make some sacrifice that you have not been willing to make. Perhaps he has asked you to give your life completely to him, yet you hesitate. Perhaps he told you you're a child, but yet still you struggle to believe that to be true. Maybe he has promised to intervene in a situation that you're struggling with, but yet still you refuse to hear him. Today, we're closing with a song. And instead of being here at the front, the musicians will be standing out of sight. Because the goal is for you to focus on the words of the song. I pray that as you listen to this song and meditate, that you may pledge in your heart this time, this season, to listen to no other voice but the voice of the Son of God.
sing in exaltation, or sing, all ye citizens of heaven commitment to listen to him. I want to give you the opportunity to do so. If you want to make that commitment, I'd love for you to stand. We can pray together to seal that decision. But this season, make, take the time to listen to what Christ has to say. That amidst the, the celebration, there will be moments of silence, of meditation, where we can hear him speaking to us and only Him. Let us pray together. Our dear Father, our friend, we thank You for the gift of salvation. And we thank You for the wrapping in which that gift comes. For the Bible tells us in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave. This gift came wrapped in love. And we are so grateful for what Jesus has done. But Father, help us not to celebrate Christmas after Christmas, yet not listen to a word that he has to say to us. Father, we pray that our lives may be molded according to your divine will, and that our hearts be changed as we commit to him and only him. Father, remove the idols, remove the selfishness, remove from us the doubt, and remove the faithfulness and disobedience. Dear Father, help us to have the mind of Christ, the mind that is obedient, that follows all the way. And we pray that in the end we may sing the song joyfully, all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercies, who through life has been my guide? Lord, we thank you for being there for us. And we pray all these things with thanksgiving is our prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Amen.